Hey everybody, hopefully everybody is out there and everybody is uh, tuning in. Let me know that uh, you're getting on board. Um, I'm looking for the comments. Uh, and then I will get to the lecture part. Hopefully you're all enthused about today's lecture. Um, let me know that the picture is doing fine and not breaking up. And I'll wait for you guys to uh, come on board. So uh, hopefully we're getting some people on board. Uh, I'm just going to wait for the audience to grow and build. Uh, let me know when you're out there. Um, yeah, okay, good. We're getting some people going. Hello, Carolyn. So, yeah, important topic, part two of the uh, carbs and insulin thing coming on. I'm just waiting for uh, the audience to build. So hopefully everyone's doing great this Sunday morning and got a lot of stuff to uh, get through. I'm going to try not to throw too much at everybody every week. Um, I don't want to give you too much to think about, but I'll quote all the studies that I can. And then if you're um, so inclined, then you can go and, and look for them uh, on your own time. So uh, today is all about um, uh, the fear mongering with carbs and insulin and the misleading and misinformation in the fitness industry that goes along with that. So uh, hopefully we have no picture problems this week like we did last week. Is the picture okay out there? It's not disintegrating, anything like that. Uh, by all means, let me know that the picture is fine, um, and we're starting to uh, build our audience. Good to see some thumbs up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, yeah, good, good stuff. So, um, let me know that I've got a good picture, and then we will uh, get right to it. Oh, lots of thumbs up. I guess we got some enthusiastic people today, so that's good to know. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad, uh, glad uh, that our technical issues are are dispensed with because last week I had to redo the whole lecture uh, and then post it to Facebook. So, um, yeah, so um, I'm going to, uh, Olivia, I'm not going to get to questions yet because um, this is a several part um, lecture series that I'm doing about uh, low carb lies and nonsense. Um, so uh, one of the first thing I'm going to do is uh, start with my lecture that everyone agreed with they they wanted to uh, see and follow and and that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, good morning, uh, James, Jason, uh, Tracy, everyone who's saying good morning, appreciate it. Um, just uh, gonna we're just gonna wait for a few scragglers and then I'm gonna get uh, to the lecture on fear mongering with carbs and insulin and the misinformation that especially goes on in the fitness industry which is uh, absolutely um, ridiculous so um, oh good to know that the sound is better as well so I guess we must have really had problems uh, uh, last week so by all means folks hit your share button get people on board uh, get people following um, some intelligent conversation um, People often, after we go live, they send me comments from their Twitter feed, Facebook um, Facebook walls, and things like that. And I can't believe what's out there passing for for knowledge and information, and worst of all, passing for advice. That's what that's what bothers me the most. So, uh, by all means, um, you know, uh, share, hit the share button. Let's get people involved in some intelligent conversation. So, uh, Tom uh, Shores, uh, I'm not sure I said that right just did that so I appreciate it um, by all means uh, share the live and uh, yes I am an early bird I get up at four every day and now I've started getting up at three on Sundays just so I can uh, get to you guys in in a decent time frame so um, I'm ready to hit it if you guys are ready to uh, get into the lecture what I will do is what I did last week I'll do a little bit of what I have in mind for the lecture um, and as I'm doing that, I can't see comments, so I will uh, do a little bit of the lecture and come back and look for comments, uh, make sure you're all still with me and still breathing and not bored out of your tree, and then uh, we'll, um, I'll continue to get through it. So uh, hopefully everybody uh, who wants to join uh, is here, and if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to get right to the lecture part. So just throw some thumbs up if you're ready to, uh, for me to get into that. And the stop killing time, I was just hoping for a bigger audience, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to get going regardless. So uh, hopefully that's all good with you guys. So for right now, I am going to shrink the comment section. Uh, you won't be able, I won't be able to see comments, uh, but I will um, stop in the middle of uh, some of the important points and come back and uh, see what comments uh, we have. 
and then uh, I'll take it from there. So hold your questions uh, till the end, or when I come back, you can uh, for sure uh, give me some comments on that as well. So uh, I'm going to get right to the lecture part, and uh, let's get into it. Yeah, so I want to uh, tell you about... Um, carbs and insulin and the fear mongering, fear mongering that's going on and the bad science that's been going on as well. So um, one of the major problems with low carb diet principles and arguments is the demonizing and vilifying of the hormone insulin, okay? And it's a faulty argument that insulin only role is for fat storage and hinting that fat storage is all that insulin does. And you should look to lectures like uh, Dr. Diana Schwartzbein. I've used her in my metabolic damage articles. Uh, she talks about the important roles of things like insulin and the, if anything's going to be demonized, it would be things like ketosis that tells, that tells you that your body is in a constant breaking down state, which is not healthy. So the Atkins diet book, and remember I'm basing this lecture series on where it all started with a lot of the lies and misinformation that Atkins promoted. Uh, the Atkins diet book uh, had a chapter called insulin, and I quote, insulin, the hormone that makes you fat. All right. The, um, and then uh, this argument is just completely limited in scope, and I'll explain why. Um, it's at a kindergarten level of fear mongering. Um, and again, it's all about uh, for profits, right? So I, I told you about that before. Uh, another book called Protein Power labels insulin as the monster hormone. Uh, and Barry Sears of The Zone Diet argued that insulin is the single most determinant of your weight uh, and by, associ by association your overweightness. Now, to be fair, Barry Sears' argument in the zone is at least close. Insulin does have a lot to do with weight management, but it's not a monster hormone that makes you fat. All those arguments are trite. All right, those, those are points that lack context when considering that the human body doesn't manufacture any hormone uh, that it doesn't need for some survival reason. So to label any hormone as evil or monster, whether it's cortisol or insulin or any of those things, is to mis misrepresent fundamental endocrine uh, activity in biochemistry, and you need to understand that, okay? Your body manufactures what it needs in order to survive. So consider this also, when demonizing insulin, how come the hardcore, juice-produced, performance-enhancing, drug-using bodybuilders, how come they regularly inject fast-acting insulin uh, mid and post-workout in order to drive caloric energy into the muscles. If insulin only makes you fat and that's its only role, then why would bodybuilders who want to look lean, stay lean, be injecting it regularly after workouts? So no, insulin is simply a storage hormone with bias, which is what I've said uh, many, many times. And you can bias where it stores um, fuel toward muscle and intracellularly, which is what you want. So insulin is an anabolic hormone that's essential for survival, okay? What you need to know and embrace, and I'm gonna say this phrase a few times, in a calorie controlled environment, there's no predisposition for your body to store fat from any energy source, protein, fat, or carbs. So let me read that again. In a calorie controlled environment, there's no predisposition for your body to store fat from any macro energy source. And people need to get that through their heads. For instance, in one of my books, I talked about um, the guy who went on the all potato diet and made sure all his carbs and most of his food energy came from potatoes. And he lost a substantial amount of weight doing that. Now, I'm not advocating a potato diet and some crazy fad diet, but he did it to make a point uh, that starches would apparently make you fat, and actually his weight went the other way and he leaned out. So, first of all, let's examine and understand insulin and its role, okay, in more real and accurate terms than how the fitness industry presents it. So, let's, let's, get, let's get to a little bit of the biochemistry. I won't bore you with it, but you need to understand it, all right? Insulin is a key hormone in the regulation of fuel metabolism. Therefore, it also plays a key role in optimal metabolic function. And I always talk about optimizing metabolism. Insulin plays a role in that. If you try to keep it artificially repressed and depressed, you're going to suffer an artificially depressed and repressed metabolism as well. And no one's looking at that. 
So there's many factors that govern insulin release and insulin use and uptake. Other hormones like glucagon, amino acids, uh, gut insulogenic hormones, and of course glucose itself. Glucose being the most important stimulus for insulin release, all right? Insulin promotes anabolic processes, okay? And that means the building up of, all right? Anabolic means the building up of, all right? And insulin, the release of insulin, inhibits catabolic processes, which is the breaking down of um, substances and whatever, uh, biochemistry, all right? So in the fitness industry, they use that to say that you can't break down fat when insulin is present because insulin uh, is a storage hormone. But that's not the whole story, all right? Insulin also inhibits production of glucose by the liver. And what we need to emphasize here is that the endocrinology of the body is a series of very delicate checks and balances of processes and function. Insulin and glucagon, all these things, uh, cortisol. Insulin's no exception. To demonize it makes no sense. And as one of the master hormones, okay, um, insulin can have a huge effect on thyroid as well. If you keep trying to depress insulin levels, then it's likely to suffer thyroid issues uh, down the road. And we've seen this in uh, female uh, figure competitors over and over and over again, right? So insulin, I'll just read one more paragraph and then I'll come and see what your comments are, but it's gonna get interesting real quick, folks. Uh, insulin signals to the body that the body is now in what we call a fed state, okay? Meaning the body is acknowledging that it's just been fed. That's not a bad thing. That's an essential thing for survival. Imagine if you were always trying to keep insulin levels as low as possible, but artificially, by avoiding starches, for example. Then your body is never gonna receive the signal of being in a fed state, and therefore you're always gonna be chronically hungry, chronically famished, too hungry actually to, uh, and, and likely, you'll be too hungry and you'll likely be in an absolute calorie deficit in real terms, no matter how much fibrous veggies you eat, okay? So remember, insulin is an anabolic hormone with a fuel storage bias. And that's really important if you're trying to tone and tighten your physique or if you're trying to uh, uh, enhance physique development. So if you're always trying to keep insulin levels artificially low, then you're always gonna be in a catabolic state breaking down muscle and tissue in order to use for energy. That's the argument against uh, starch carbs, but it's faulty. This chronic catabolic state leads to things like adrenal burnout, chronic fatigue, thyroid dysfunction and disruption, all because you've been misinformed that insulin is a demon hormone that's gonna make you fat. Without the anabolic postprandial, and postprandial just means after meals, without the anabolic postprandial effects, you put your body in a more catastrophic state of ill repair. And more than that, you lose your ability to determine satiety, your hunger and fullness levels become disrupted. You can't tell the difference of when you're hungry and when you're not and when you're satiated because you'll be hungry all the time. And that makes no sense at all. Too low of insulin will also make it hard for you to think and to maintain normal mood states, okay? Now that's very important. I'm gonna take a pause there, see if there's any comments or questions on that uh, so far. Uh, let me know, I'm gonna, um, so I'm back to the comment section. Uh, if you have any comments so far, uh, fire when ready, otherwise I will continue. So, so far so good folks, interesting so far. Are you seeing holes in the argument? that insulin is some monster hormone that makes you fat and its association with carbohydrates is also something uh, dastardly. So uh, let me know that you're getting all this. Oh, oh I'm, uh, James is asking, can I explain it in a little more detail? Um, yeah, don't, don't worry, James, I'm getting there. I just wanted to take a pause uh, just in case uh, people had comments or questions right now. So, uh, so far, people's, uh, people are understanding what I'm saying. Um, didn't know that, love it, okay, good, all right, great. Uh, I see there's a delayed reaction between me asking you guys uh, for comments or to let me know you're still with me uh, versus when that comes across my screen. So I wanna continue now uh, with the whole carbohydrate insulin thing. Um, I don't see many comments, so I'm just gonna continue with that and I'll take a pause after the next section. So uh, bear with me, let's learn a little bit more about the realities of carbohydrates and insulin, shall we? So um, 
very, very important to, to keep that uh, to keep that in mind. So it's not just carbs. Okay, I'm going to continue now, and I'll come back in a few minutes. It's not just carbs that trigger insulin release anyway. That's another common myth and mistaken information of the fitness industry. That's another lie. In fact, it's well established that protein and fat-rich foods as well can induce substantial amounts of insulin secretion. There's something called, uh, Susan Holt started, an insulin index of foods. The insulin demand generated by 1,000 kilojoule portions of common foods. That began in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, um, issue number 50, 1997, all right? Now, since then, you can do a search after this about the insulin index of foods. It keeps getting updated all the time. In these studies, uh, and the initial Holt study of the insulin index of food, show that under fasting conditions, a quarter pound of beef raised insulin levels in diabetics as much as a quarter pound of straight pure sugar. Let me read that again. Under fasting conditions in the original um, insulin index of food study, under fasting conditions, a quarter pound of beef raised insulin levels in diabetics as much as a quarter pound of pure sugar did. So using the Atkins diet as an example, Atkins extolling the virtues of cheese and beef, well, these are two foods that elevated insulin levels higher than the scary carbohydrates, uh, foods like pasta. So the amount of beef in an average burger or even three normal slices of cheddar cheese in this study jacked up insulin levels more than did two cups of pasta. All right. In the same study, again, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, uh, 1997, issue number 50, meat caused the most insulin secretion of any foods tested in the study. So if you're saying carbs are bad and meat is good, because it keeps insulin levels at bay, then that's a faulty argument as well. So, next, in the book Carbophobia, which I showed you last week, uh, author Michael, Michael Greger on page eight says, and, and I'm referring to the book for the reference here, a study done at Tufts University, a very, very respected university in the area of studying uh, nutrition and metabolism, a study at Tufts University and presented at the 2003 American Heart Association Convention compared four popular diets for over a year. They compared Weight Watchers, they compared the Zone Diet, which was fairly popular at the time, the original Atkins Diet, which was almost no carbs, and the Ornish Diet, Dean Ornish, which was almost all carbs. So now, comparing those diets over the course of a whole year, the insulin levels of those instructed to go on the Ornish diet, again, almost completely all carbs, their insulin levels dropped 27% eating an all carbs diet. Out of the four diets that were compared that year, Ornish's vegetarian diet, was carb-based diet, was the only one to significant significantly lower the so-called monster hormone that makes you fat, even though the Ornish diet is very high in carbs and includes starches. So yet, lowering insulin levels is supposedly what the Atkins diet, the Zone diet, Paleo diet, uh, Keto diet, that's what all these diets were designed to do, but what we see here um, in this uh, study presented at the American Heart Association Convention is that carbs were the hero and not the demon in regards to controlling insulin. So the question is, why aren't you hearing about this? Okay, that's important, important stuff. So we see that a carb-based diet actually lowered insulin levels, all right? So um, let's talk insulin resistance then, because that term is tossed around in the fitness industry as well. In an insulin resistance situation, okay, insulin gets the blame. All right, the pancreas is producing enough insulin, but the problem is the insulin receptor on the cells elsewhere in the body. The problem is not with insulin itself. The insulin receptors become insensitive to insulin, and certain events and chronic lifestyle choices are very important here, have a lot to do with this, causing the receptor to be down-regulated, okay? In such cases, people have higher blood insulin levels, known as hyperinsulinemia, and I'll get to that. But here's the thing as far as insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes goes. Now you need to pay attention here. 80% of people with type 2 diabetes are obese. All right? 80% of people with type 2 diabetes, which is insulin resistant diabetes, are obese. Here's what you need to know about that. 
high fat stores down regulate insulin receptors and cause a resistance to circulating insulin. The other 20% of people who are insulin resistant, studies have shown, and who are not obese, these people have a genetically inherited insulin receptor that just doesn't work properly. It's part of their genetic makeup. So what we see here is that genetic predisposition and lifestyle are the two most important elements in developing insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So if you eat a lot of processed food, fast food, uh, you don't control the amounts you eat, you eat to your full, you eat to your stuff, um, these are two important elements in the risk of developing insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes over time. Uh, that's very, very important. Uh, if, you, if you don't exercise a lot and you're substantially overweight, you're increasing the risk of developing insulin resistance. But to demonize insulin because of this makes no sense at all, okay? There's a difference between eating potato chips and eating a baked potato and then conflating the two and saying carbs are bad. That's absolutely ridiculous. There's a difference between eating oatmeal with artificial sweetener on it and eating processed box ODO cereal that's made uh, with sugar. Categorizing insulin as the hormone that makes you fat is a grossly misleading statement. And uh, for that, I refer you to the research role of diet and exercise in the management of hyperinsulinemia and associated atherosclerotic risk factors in the American Journal of Cardiology, issue number 69, 1992, page 440 to 444. Now, my clients who have come to me um, being on meds for high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes, those two things tend to go together. I've managed to get them off their meds in due time by assigning them a carb-based diet. All right. Now, how did I do that? Why did I do that? Well, the research supports me. So here's another uh, research article you can check out. Um, and I quote, high carbohydrate, high fiber diets increase peripheral insulin sensitivity in healthy and old adults. And that's in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, issue number 52, 1990, pages 524 to 528. So as you can see, I'm not just pulling this stuff out of my ass, folks. Um, it comes with experience and it comes with researching why and how things work and why and how other things are lies. So before I get to talking about insulin sensitivity, I'll just pause again, see what the comments are. Um, uh, Tony, well, Tony, I'm going to get to that, but Tony asks a great question. Tony says, uh, why do some people who eat a lot of crap or processed foods are still hungry right after they eat? That's something called rebound hypoglycemia, uh, and I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. It's in my, in my lecture in the coming minutes, Tony. But what happens is you get a big insulin dump from eating too many calories, and that postprandial insulin uh, dump produces what we call rebound hypoglycemia. Your body um, grabs all that, uh, takes care of it, and then you end up with artificially uh, low um, insulin levels again, and then you end up being artificially hungry again. That's called rebound hypoglycemia. Uh, there's too much insulin in the blood, your body overcompensates, and then you end up with too little uh, in the blood. And so this is what I meant when I said you end up confusing the satiety centers of your brain in terms of tolerable hunger or when you're even full or satiated, that all becomes disrupted and becomes dysfunctional. So, um, Okay, Tracy's asking, what is technically a low-carb diet? I'll come back to that. So are you all ready for me to continue? Is this, uh, this good stuff? Are you all, like, hanging in there with me? Um, a mental dip in the afternoon? Yeah, that, that can definitely happen. It's all about feeding, Tom. I'm going to get to that. Uh, you're just getting a little bit ahead of me. I just wanted to – I didn't want to read the whole lecture all at once because people tend to, like, zone out and tune out, especially in the morning. So – um, but I'm glad uh, everyone's uh, paying attention. So you're still with me. You're learning stuff, folks, learning about insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity, terms that are bounced around in the fitness industry by people with a kindergarten level of understanding of it all, trying to sound smarter than they are, and then they're presenting lies and, mis and misinformation as if they are facts. So... Um, yeah, Perry's just saying uh, type 2 diabetics often burn out their pancreas with poor dietary habits. Here's an interesting story, Perry. Before I got out of the hardcore end of bodybuilding, one of the reasons I got out is uh, several people that I was known or, or in my circles back then uh, who were injecting insulin, they also ended up... Uh, 
having real issues with their pancreas and ended up in in um, real poor health with uh, chronic fatigue and adrenal burnout and they were really really sick um, and it wasn't until they actually were honest with their doctors uh, that they were injecting insulin when they weren't even diabetic um, that things came around and, and there was a long way back for them it was another one of those things that took me out of that hardcore bodybuilding uh, subculture and that, that dangerous world of of equating fitness with uh, intense drug abuse. So um, if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to continue now talking a little bit about insulin sensitivity. So um, yeah, Tracy's just saying how many people, especially in California, um, you know, live in the fear of carbs. They even have a paleo section. Yeah, I know. They've yeah, I know. I, I know. It's ridiculous. This is why I'm doing this lecture, though, Tracy. Um, and it'll fall on deaf ears to people who love the what I call voguing. They love the vogue trends of the diet and fitness industry. They just follow it like sheeple. You know, we the sheeple, we follow anything that comes down the pike as if it's, you know, as if whatever comes out is new and improved when it's not. But uh, I'm going to continue now with uh, talking a little bit about insulin sensitivity. So uh, very, very important. So we know two elements increase and optimize insulin sensitivity and that's a good thing so we know exercise and relative calorie deficits all right uh, increase uh, sensitivity of uh, peripheral insulin receptors so relative calorie deficits are, are discussed in my book uh, the cycle diet all right so um, yeah they're, they're discussed in my book the cycle diet okay relative calorie deficits is all about you know in the book on that uh, and my cycle diet um, also talks about metabolism which most nutrition books don't all right that's the problem with paleo and the rest of this nonsense they don't talk metabolism uh, but my cycle diet counts on increasing insulin sensitivity through regular underfeeding with frequent smaller meals if you're going to have smaller meals you're going to have a smaller insulin spike right uh, very very important as well we see this with intermittent fasting and things like that oh eat one meal a day with as many calories as you want well then you get a huge insulin dump all right and a huge insulin dump over time can can lead to the the what we call hyperinsulinemia i'll get to that so the cycle diet counts on increasing insulin sensitivity through regular underfeeding exercise of course and and frequent smaller meals and then counting on insulin as that anabolic hormone that i discussed earlier to drive extra calories into the muscles on the overfeeding days or spike meals or whatever you want to call it as just like the the bodybuilders do who inject the stuff this way we're just doing it naturally and we're counting on the insulin spike we're not dreading it okay so this is why it helps to understand endocrinology and biochemistry that's not the same as understanding nutrition all right and people confuse the two all the time oh i'm a nutrition specialist and i can talk about paleo okay do you know anything about metabolism do you know anything about human biochemistry and endocrinology and how all that works together uh, most don't so um if you're fault now here's the thing in the fitness industry where they like to demonize insulin we know the two most prevalent things that increase insulin sensitivity which is what we want all right are eating mostly healthy whole unprocessed foods and exercising regularly so if you're in the fitness industry you're already exercising regularly and you're probably already already eating watching what you eat and eating mostly a healthy whole food diet therefore the odds that insulin is an issue for you is overstated industry fitness industry gobbledygook misinformation and mythology okay it's usually overweight people who have to pay attention to this stuff not fitness industry enthusiasts so again the fear mongering and the scare tactics is talking to one population and then the fitness industry takes it and tries to sell it to a different population to whom is already doing everything they need to be doing to have great insulin sensitivity which optimizes metabolism so to reiterate it's not wholly hyperinsulinemia that is the problem all right and it's chronic hyperinsulinemia that is the problem and i'll get to that it's more the receptor when we talk about insulin resistance increasing insulin sensitivity through healthy whole food diet exercise frequent small meals reducing body fat all work to increase insulin sensitivity in a healthy way
obesity and uncontrolled processed food uh, intake, high calorie, high fat diets, they increase the risk of insulin resistance and the research is pretty damn clear on that, all right? Furthermore, when you look across cultures like T. Colin Campbell does in his books, Here's a guy that's only studied nutrition and metabolism for 50 years at the PhD level, but we should listen to the fitness uh, industry geeks with no education at all. T. Colin Campbell, 50 years, all right, researching. What he shows in his books in a, in a cultural meta-analysis across tr traditional diets, across cultures, across the globe, have always been carb-based diets. High complex carbs, high fiber, lower fat, okay? Like in Asia, you ate rice with every meal. In Eastern Europe, you ate potatoes all the time. In, North, in South America, you used maize slash corn, okay? Uh, in India, you used uh, naan and things like that, okay? In, in North America, we had bread at every meal, okay? Um, that kind of mountains of research that shows uh, putting... Um, that carb-based diets were the traditional factor of all cultures across the globe were based, and that's how human beings survived and thrived. It's shown, uh, for instance, in, in the research um, um, anthropologist that developing the starch enzyme amylase was what allowed humans to be nomadic and travel. Amylase is a carbs digesting enzyme and it's allowed it's what allowed humans to be nomadic and and disperse throughout the globe and establish world population not protein not fat carbs okay so that's very very important as well we also see from mountains of research that putting insulin resistant individuals on higher carb low fat diets reduce hyperinsulinemia hypertension and hyperlipidemia and that's that's high fat level so that's also in the American Journal of Cardiology, uh, issue number 69, 1992, pages 440 to 444. So in terms of low-carb dieting, the evidence is abundant also that depletion of glycogen stores, and I talk about this again in my cycle diet, can result in chronic fatigue, weakness, cramping, training apathy or apathy for life in general, metabolic downregulation, in one study, uh, for instance, if you want to talk about the workout side of things, in one study, endurance athletes were tested against themselves training on different diets. On the high-carb diet, uh, they did high-carb, high high-fat, low-carb, that kind of thing. On the high-carb diet, trainees were able to work out and maintain their, their glycogen levels, but they were able to work out three times longer before reaching exhaustion when, com when compared to when they consumed a high-fat, low-carb diet. They were able to go on a high carb diet 180 minutes versus only 57 minutes on the low carb diet. So right there, it tells you if you go chronically low carb and you exercise regularly, you're going to reach a point of burnout. And glycogen replenishment is also essential for having an optimized metabolism and a healthy thyroid, as I've explained in many of my books, particularly, okay, my cycle diet. We talk about this all the time, the connection between glycogen restoration and a healthy optimized metabolism, okay? So yes, chronic hyperinsulinemia, which means too much insulin, can be a marker for several disease states and is often an indicator for a person being uh, unhealthily overweight by a substantial amount, okay? And while yes, carbohydrate ingestion leads to release in insulin, high carbohydrate ingestion does not cause hyperinsulinemia, okay? The reasoning in the fitness industry that if X equals Y and Y equals uh, Z, then X must equal Z as well, that simply makes no sense, okay? In all kinds of ways, that's wrong. In all the ways, hopefully you followed the rationale that I've pointed out to you. It would be like saying, okay, chronic hyperinsulinemia is an issue for several disease states and carbs cause a release of insulin, um, therefore carbs are bad. Well, that would be like saying that eating undercooked chicken increases the risk of salmonella, therefore eating chicken is bad, okay? It makes no sense. So make no mistake, a healthy carb-based diet that includes complex starch carbs can lower insulin levels, maintain healthy insulin biochemical balance and regulation, keep your um, hypothalamic satiety hunger 
uh, balance in check um, and keep that in mind. And furthermore, you didn't get fat because you have insulin resistance. You have insulin resistance because you got fat. 80% of the time, that's true. Seldom does this apply to people in the fitness industry who eat healthy and exercise regularly, both of which increase insulin sensitivity. And we also need to specify that chronic hyperinsulinemia is not the same thing as an insulin spike. Those are two very, very different things. All right. If, if chronic hyperinsulinemia and an insulin spike were the same thing, then every time you had Christmas dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, anything like that, and you had a postprandial insulin spike higher than normal, oh my God, you know, I'm risking my health. It's just not how the checks and balances system of the body works. Chronic elevated insulin is a problem an insulin spike is something else. So we also need to talk about neuropeptide Y levels in the brain. And this goes back to the question or the comment that was posed earlier about rebound hypoglycemia. And I talk in my books, Beyond Metabolism and Understanding Metabolism, uh, I talk a lot about tolerable hunger. And this is why. When you eat too many calories in a meal, you might experience a rebound hypoglycemic response. In other words, you shouldn't be hungry later, but you are, okay? And that's from usually too many calories composed of too much junk in the previous meal, not enough fiber, not enough stuff that slows intestinal motility. So you get a little bit tired and fatigued. Um, I call that like the sugar narc narcotizing effect of sugar where you could just you know fall asleep and nap out. Sometimes that's a good thing. But if there's too little insulin from trying to keep it artificially uh, repressed by not eating starches and keeping calories too low, then not enough passes the neuropeptide, the blood-brain barrier all right, in the brain, and you experience um, brain fog, ADD, forgetfulness, irritability. Sound familiar, folks? And you're chronically hungry all the time, but you, when you start eating over time, that effect of too little insulin, you don't know when to stop eating anymore because you've ruined and disrupted your satiety and the body signaling of when you've actually had enough food. So to recap, the hormone insulin is not your enemy and it's not what makes you fat solely in and of itself. It's not the monster hormone. We have too many online trainers trying to play doctor but who have a kindergarten level of education and understanding of the things they're actually trying to talk about. So um, I'm going to leave it there for now because uh, I've got a whack load of information and, and research and studies and I don't want to throw too much at you guys uh, every single week, but I wanted to dispel the fear-mongering of carbs and insulin uh, once and for all, of course this won't be once and for all, as soon as I post this, then all the wannabe Vogue trend followers are going to come online and mention this study and that study, but hopefully, folks, you follow the logic of the biochemistry. So now I'll get to your questions and comments. Um, uh, Laura Lou just says, I love that I eat this way. I'm dying to read the Cycle Diet book but excited that I figured out this approach worked wonders for my physique. Of course it will. You have to replenish glycogen stores if you're working out. Otherwise, you risk uh, suppressing and depressing metabolism. I talked about this in my book, Metabolic Damage and the Dangers of Dieting, that the ladies who tended to do the most cardio, like the nonsense of seven days a week cardio, morning and night with training in between, while controlling their diets and, in, in essence, starving themselves, those were the people who experienced the most post-contest rebounds of, of gaining way too much weight than they should have based upon what they were eating. Their body overcompensated and they ended up establishing a new set point, not just of body weight, but of body fat. So their body fat percentage went up and their body weight went up in a way that is very, very depressing, especially to uh, human females. So, um, And now, Laura Lewis, not just the Cycle Diet book, okay? Um, the Cycle Diet book, all right? It's not just the book. There's a course. I have a whole course on the Cycle Diet that outlines a lot of this stuff, and you can find that at thecycle.diet. Uh, that's thecycle.diet, no.com, and it's the cycle, all one word, uh, dot diet. Yvette says, have you ever been on a low-carb diet for an extended period of time and has it affected your thyroid? 
uh, how long would it take to repair your thyroid if you were to go to a high carb diet? Well, it's not so simple either. And uh, one, no, I, I, I don't think I ever went on a low carb diet because uh, I always just knew better. Um, but I had many clients who have come to me to repair them, uh, you know, uh, post post damage. Um, and it, your question is a bit uh, indicative of what I see all the time, Yvette, in that um, your second part of your question, how long would it take to repair your thyroid if you were to go to a high carb diet? It's not so simple. For some people, they think, oh, well, I'll just go on and, and repair. And we see these wannabe trainers online as well. The most eye rolling, ridiculous thing I heard recently is that uh, these new online trainers are calling themselves metabolic experts. Oh, well, you know, we, we know how to, uh, you know, we know how to retrain your metabolism and fix your metabolism. We're, we're me metabolism fixers. It's not that easy. The biochemistry of the human body is delicate. For some ladies, uh, they go past the point of no return. They're never going to get back to where they were. It's the old quote uh, that I hear all the time uh, from ladies is the quote that I've written about many times is, I wish I wish I was as fat now as I was when I first started dieting thinking I was fat. Um, because of all the weight gained of doing it wrong. So um, it's not just simple enough to go high carb diet too. It's the composition, it's the meal timing, uh, it's things like that. So um, it's really something that you need to respond to the individual on a case to case basis. So um, yeah, there's all, you know, the nonsense of reverse dieting. They're all catchy terms, but they don't mean anything to me um, in terms of, you know, realistic things. You can't imply linear effects in a non-linear body. The human body doesn't work in linear ways. So we can't say reverse dieting and, you know, do this for this many weeks and your body does that. Your body works on its own schedule depending on how much damage and, and the history of the way you've been feeding it. So that's something that requires monitoring um, and all these like we'll fix your metabolism trainers out there. Ask them what their background is in, in biochemistry and endocrinology. Uh, I encourage you to watch Dr. Schwartzbein's lecture, uh, two-part lecture that's in my metabolic um, damage books um, uh, and my metabolic damage articles. You can probably find that scottablefitness.com slash blog archives and you'll find that there as well. So um, very, very important too. Um, you really want to emphasize that in the fitness industry, if you're already eating mostly healthy and you're already exercising regularly, you're already working on increasing insulin sensitivity. So fear mongering that applies to people who are overweight isn't the same thing. You're talking about two demographics, two very, very different demographics of people. And we need to understand that. So, um, yeah, we, we got way too many catchphrases in the fitness industry, like reverse dieting and carb backloading. And, ooh, that sounds really scientific, but it's not. <laughs> okay, it's just not. So um, we need to get to people who actually understand this stuff. Um, sometimes I have a little bit of arrogance myself because of, the amount of research it takes to write 20 books, folks, I've written at least 20 books now, and the amount of research that goes into that uh, over the course of 10, 15 years, yeah, I would call myself an expert in this area. Um, so when people want to compare me to some trainer at the gym, and they, they write me and say, well, my trainer said this, you know, sometimes my response is, how many books has your trainer written? When he's written as many books as I have, then I'll listen to what he has to say. Until then, I look for PhDs besides someone's name. I look for people who are involved in objective research, uh, not trying to subjectively sell people something. So that's why I refer to T. Colin Campbell, Pritikin, Ornish. Uh, now, Pritikin and Ornish, of course, have something to sell. But T. Colin Campbell, um, 50 years at the PhD level of research in nutrition and metabolism. So uh, definitely something you want to look into. But what we saw here, what I presented to you, was that carb-based diets actually increase insulin sensitivity and decrease insulin levels when you follow frequent small meals, regular exercise, and healthy whole food diets. Eat food, not a lot, mostly plants. So we got to stop the fitness industry wannabes from trying to turn this into rocket science that only they can unravel with their magic formulas, okay? That's just not how it works. If you need a good coach, then get a good coach. That's a hard thing to do in this day and age with everybody and their brother 
you know, hanging a shingle out online saying I'm a coach. I mean, <laughs> they've competed in one contest at a local level and they've won, so now they're experts in everything, nutrition, metabolism, blah, blah, blah. Uh, makes no sense. So um, that's a little bit of a rant uh, off schedule. So, uh, yeah, I'm ready to take your questions and your comments, folks. Uh, hopefully you found that engaging uh, and enlightening, but we really need to stop the fear-mongering and the, what I said, the low carb lies and nonsense because it continues. And as we'll see next week, I'm going to present to you some faulty science. As long as you guys are interested in me continuing this lecture series, because I can do this for weeks. That's how much uh, research and information I have at my disposal arguing for the carb-based diet. So we need to get that back out there. Uh, the fitness industry is probably the worst offender for misleading people because the people in it themselves have what we call weekend educations, right? Uh, they go online to popular sites, and then they become one of we the sheeple. They follow Vogue trends. Uh, they don't do their homework. They don't do the background. They don't go to academic sites. Um, and then they believe so, anything that someone with a large following says. So, um, you know, you can get a fitness bunny right now. You can find online with 100,000 plus followers because she takes daily pictures of her booty. And then starts dispensing nonsensical nutrition advice doesn't mean they know what they're doing because they have a hundred thousand followers that's again faulty logic just like i was explaining uh earlier on so very very important stuff so um yeah i'm gonna keep doing this unless you guys uh, have your own agenda you can always write me and tell me that you'd like me to talk about this or talk about that uh, but um, until i think i've presented my argument uh, then I want to keep going with this uh, lecture series. So uh, hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully you guys uh, understand that. So um, Tracy Lynn says my sister had uh, had chronic high blood had high blood sugar when she was pregnant. They actually had her on a low carb diet for her all of her pregnancy. I'm going to get to that in future weeks, Tracy. I actually have research on that where Atkins was advising women to go on a no carb diet, and he actually had to take that back because of issues that were happening. Um, with pregnant women and how unhealthy it was. Um, I've, I've coached many people through pregnancies and, uh, you know, I used a carb-based diet to do it. Healthy whole food diet, that's where you're going to get all of your, um, all your micronutrients and, and phytonutrients and things like that. So very, very important as well. So, um, yeah, so uh, keep that in mind. So, um Mike says, oh yeah, Trey asked a question about what is a low carb diet and where should our carbs in a gram amount per day? I don't do, I don't work with amounts, uh, Mike, because again, that's faulty logics, right? You're telling everybody just because someone is five foot nine and 180 pounds and the next per person is five foot nine and 180 pounds that they should all equal uh, the same amount of grams of carbohydrate per day makes no sense. We need to stop with the quantification nonsense and learn more about biofeedback. Now, so I don't, we don't count grams, we count uh, portion sizes, and then we listen to our body's biofeedback to determine whether we should add food or take food off meal per meal and listen to what I call tolerable hunger, which you can learn about in my book, Beyond Metabolism. Um, that's that's this book here beyond metabolism all right you can find that on my so what is a low carb diet I would say anything where uh, carbs are are substantially uh, deliberately suppressed and repressed because of fear-mongering especially starch carbs you're not going to make the carb up difference okay by eating as much fibrous veggies as you want another industry myth you know I remember back in the day there was uh, in my area, there was low-carb diet gurus training people for contests who had their clients. They said they could eat as, as much fibrous veggies as they wanted. And they were trying to eat 9 or 10 pounds of fibrous veggies a day. Also not healthy. That amount of fiber uh, induces and produces uh, intestinal bloating, stomach distension, stomach irritation, all kinds of things. If it's not natural, it's not right. And there's nothing less natural than trying to eat five pounds of veggies in a meal. It just makes no sense. So, um, you know, if you want to do it in macros, Mike, I don't like doing that because numbers don't really 
mean a whole lot, but anything less than I, I think 30% of calories per day from, from carbs would be a mistake. That would be a low carb diet. But it's more the notion of trying to eliminate starch carbs. That makes no sense. And uh, Mike, uh, I don't know if you're new here or not, but I've presented over and over again uh, my clients, uh, protege, Andy Sinclair, uh, um, fitness model, cover model, eats carbs, eats six meals a day, follows my cycle diet, Crystal Louise Fit, who's helped me with my great glutes at home uh, project. You've all seen her. What are her favorite foods? Rice and oatmeal. Starch, starch, starch. Myself, rice and potatoes are, and oatmeal or oat bran in the morning, sometimes grits. So, um, yeah. So very, very important uh, to understand this stuff that um, insulin and carbs fear-mongering makes no sense. When you're talking about insulin resistance, you're usually talking about a demographic who are overweight, okay? And they're not overweight because they have insulin resistance. They have insulin resistance because they're overweight. And that has a lot to do with lifestyle factors, exercise, quality of food, things like that. Tony says, just curious, can you explain how taking insulin by these uh, pro-steroid freaks turns them into mass monsters? Because back in the day, they, aren't, they didn't. Yeah, of course I can explain that. It's kind of what I was hinting at, Tony. Maybe you missed the early part of the lecture, but the bodybuilders inject okay, insulin toward the end of their workout, and then they go eat a, a bunch of real simple, fast carbs. And because insulin is a storage hormone with bias, that drives okay um, the calories into the muscles and volumizes the muscles because uh, along with carbs you you usually store for every gram of carbs you usually store about 2.7 grams of water and if you do this within the muscle then the muscle blows up right the muscle volume is like think of it like blowing up a balloon okay it just expands 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 so that's what's going on there uh, but there's a huge price to pay there in terms of pancreatic health and um, the balance of human biochemistry and, and hormonal balance um, a lot of the body goes same thing hormonally right they go on uh, steroids and stuff for years and years they go off and then they have to be on hormone replacement therapy the rest of their lives and they're only 30 years old so or 35 years old so um, yeah I, I agree with you Tony I like the the days I came up in those days where the, what I call mass with class uh, Arnold Bill Pearl uh, people like that before the days of growth hormone and insulin and and thyroid and all of the rest of it but, but that's why I got out I'm you know I know about that world I don't want to know about that world so um, Jason asks as far as rice goes brown or white does it make a huge difference in which one you eat with meals throughout the day as far as energy and nutrition value. Nutrition value, yes, uh, it makes a difference. Brown rice has more nutrition value, uh, but not by a w large margin. It's a great question, actually. Metabolically, no, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Cosmetically, yes. So whether you eat um, basmati, jasmine, uh, regular, make sure that you eat long grain rice, okay? Long grain rice, the longer it takes rice to cook, Okay, uh, the, the more cosmetically friendly it's going to be because uh, your body's not going to make water uh, in order to digest and process it. Your body's going to use water to digest and process it. So you're not going to retain as much water that way. So that was a great question, Jason. Great, great question. So again, we see the difference nutritionally versus metabolically versus cosmetically. Okay, those are three different categories that most people in the fitness industry put into one. And that's just not true. So, um, Catherine says, when you've spent 50 years counting everything you eat, biofeedback seems like a, a leap of faith. I don't think, I think it's a leap of faith to think that um, counting everything you eat, that's a leap of faith. This outside in dependency, when we know calorie counting is can, can be off by as much as 40%. For instance, an apple, if you eat two apples of the exact same size, then the caloric energy that they give depends on where they were grown in the orchard, how much sunlight they got, things like that. So you could say, oh, two apples weigh exactly the same. They both have this many calories. No, they don't. Um, again, so 
Um, it's reverse. It's what I call North American diet mentality madness, Catherine. When you say that when you spent 50 years counting everything you eat, biofeedback seems like such a leap of faith. The leap of faith is in the outside-in system of thinking you can count everything and produce the illusion of control. The actual truth comes from the wisdom of the body and learning how to listen to it and count on it and determine from there your what we call a need state. And that's what all my books are all about, all right? De determining tolerable hunger, determining portion sizes without counting calories. So the leap of faith is actually in the North American diet mentality madness. All right, when we look at cultures across the world who aren't obsessed with macros and calories and they're just fine, the French paradox, for instance, um, people who don't do that. And if we do a reverse analysis, we see that people with the most weight problems are the chronic dieters who do the most counting. So the leap of faith is actually in a broken system that doesn't work. So uh, that's a really good comment you just gave, Catherine, because it shows the North American bias towards something that doesn't work and never has worked. So uh, that's very, very uh, a good point. The leap of faith should be in knowing one's body and counting on its wisdom to communicate with you. But the problem there, Catherine, is the North American diet mentality of outside-in number crunching tells you to ignore your biofeedback to the point where you don't even know what it is anymore. It tells you you know, when you're extremely hungry or hunger is keeping you up at night or you're getting brain fog or, oh, you just ignore that because your calories say this. Uh, no, you don't ignore that. That's your body trying to communicate with you. And in my books, I talk about all the ways your body tries to communicate with you. This is the language of the body. Biofeedback is the language of not only of the body, but of your particular body. And that's the truth. And, the, and that shouldn't require a leap of faith that should require a foundation of faith. That's where your faith should be in the biofeedback of the body. That's why my people, uh, cover model Andy, my before and after people, myself after four decades, I couldn't tell you what my macros are. I couldn't tell you what my calories are. But I've been lean for four decades. How does that work? I was known as the trainer of champions for putting people on carb-based diets. Okay, so how does that work? So um, very, very important stuff. So. Um, you know, great question though, Catherine, but hopefully I gave you something uh, to consider and to think about. Um, Nancy wants to know about toxins in brown rice but not white rice. I don't know. I don't pay much attention to anything based in fear mongering. If it gets to a point where I have to address it, I will. But this one is specifically about the fear mongering to do with the hormone insulin and that we need to understand our body manufactures hormones because it needs to. Uh, and it needs to for all kinds of for health and for survival and for all these other things so very very important stuff so any uh, further comments folks it's been about an hour so I'll be happy to take a few more questions related or unrelated um, if not hopefully you guys are enjoying this series on low carb lies and nonsense uh, I'm finally getting the numbers I was hoping to get at the beginning <laughs> so it's just happening now but in the future please when you see uh, breakfast with the coach is every week at the same time 5 a.m. Pacific time uh, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, by all means um, please share in advance so we can get people on here and start educating the public so hopefully you don't mind uh, me taking a lecture format for the next few weeks so I can get through the stuff uh, that I think is important and yes I'll go back to studies that are 20 years old because I think uh, that's very very important as well so um, so let me know that you, you're okay with the lecture format um, and it doesn't look like there's more comments coming in so hopefully you learned something hopefully you benefited from uh, attending today and by all means every time I go live hit the share button folks um, I want to get that out there. So uh, books of mine you should consider right now are Understanding Metabolism. Uh, let me just show that to you. So, uh, And for um, Understanding Metabolism, uh, for Catherine, spent 50 years counting everything and, and thinks of biofeedback's a leap of faith. You might want to try this book, The Anti-Diet Approach to Weight Loss and Weight Control, another one of my books. All right, and as I mentioned before, uh, beyond metabolism, all right, how your brain, biology, and environment create and perpetuate weight issues and what you can do about it. And of course, my cycle diet book, which is not just a book, it's a course. And it's as you can see here, 
uh, when, why, and how to use refeeds and cheat days to optimize metabolism and stay lean year round. All right, and that's a course, the cycle dot diet. The cycle is one word, uh, dot diet. So, um, so again, folks, uh, that's the session for today. We're running around uh, one hour, so I like to keep it for an hour. I'm glad you attended, and I hope you learned something. And by all means, please. Uh, Share, share, share. Uh, I'll repost this later, of course, to my uh, to my YouTube under the playlist Breakfast with the Coach. So uh, thanks for being out there. Uh, if you weren't out there, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for me to be here. So um, yeah, hopefully you learned something and you'll tune in next week where I'm going to get to faulty science about um, the misleading elements of uh, carbs research and low carb nonsense and lies and things like that. So. We're going to continue debunking the whole low-carb movement and the whole under-education of the fitness industry and uh, what we can do about it. So um, hopefully I'll see you all next time, next week. Uh, thanks for the thumbs and the hearts across the board. Uh, it really, really uh, helps me determine what I'm going to do in the following weeks. So uh, stay tuned next week, folks. I'm off for my uh, Sunday morning Greet the World walk, and uh, I'm going to head out. So. Um, yeah, so that's all about uh, carbs and insulin fear-mongering, and then next week I'll get into some of the faulty science as well. Uh, so, um, you know, hit the share button, tell your friends, and I will see you next time.